What's up, guys? I'm EJ, joined by Kendall, and thank you all for checking us out here. We're going to be talking about the Iverson Classic, that All-American game that happened this past weekend. Kendall, it was a really great event because we haven't really gotten to see a lot of these high school prospects, the top guys, go at each other for really almost a calendar year, plus, calendar year plus, really, when you think about it, because we had the pandemic, which stopped a lot of last, the end of, of high school seasons last year. You had the, uh, the, the pandemic, of course, stopping the AAU circuit and then you know this high school basketball season was a mismosh of kind of craziness and, and not the same kind of high school season um so so this was in many ways the first time a lot of observers and scouts got to see these guys go at each other um mano y mano so it was a really great showcase i'm excited to see uh what you thought about this game yeah and you know it was excellent for uh for the fans as well you know great for basketball fans like you said great for basketball evaluators we we saw um, you know, this was an NBA sanctioned event. Uh, so we saw, you know, NBA scouts in the building, NBA front office members in the building. And I think that raised the level of competition because, you know, these guys were not only playing, you know, for, for pride. They weren't not only, they weren't only just playing for, you know, the fans to put on a show, but they were also playing to impress NBA scouts, scouts that, you know, this is their first time, you know, these players being able to match up against some of these guys. Because, like you said, there was no real high school season. There was no uh, AAU season for the most part. So because of that, you know, even when it comes to rankings, you know, we, we, I mean, we all know these guys pay attention to rankings. Even if they say they don't, you know, you might be a guy who's like, man, I'm the fifth ranked point guard in the country going against the number two point guard in the country. But I haven't even had to get a chance to play it in a year. So the rankings might be a little bit off. Let me prove to some of these scouts in attendance that I'm actually the best point guard in the country. I'm actually the best wing in the country. So we saw a lot of competition, a lot of competitiveness from these players. And it turned it t- that turned into what was, I thought, a very entertaining basketball game with a lot of breakout stars, yeah. guys that you expected to play great, that played great, guys that you may not have heard of or may not have known what kind of games some of these guys had. Uh, now, you know, these guys can really play. So I thought it was quite the showcase game. Yeah, and I thought, you know, when I was watching it in my head, I thought, man, this is actually, you know, a lot more entertaining than, the, like, the NBA All-Star game was this year. And I say that not because of the level of play was as good or the players were as talented, but because the game was just way more uh, competitive. You know, the NBA All-Star game has had that issue for several years now. Um, I know they put the rule in at the end of the game, which they tried to implement in this game as well. It didn't seem quite as clear. The announcers didn't seem to know exactly what was going on. But nonetheless, I know they've done some things to try to uh, up the competition, but just because of the, the, the nature of this game, again, you had guys who had not played against each other for a long time, NBA scouts in the building. NBA scouts have been scouting these guys all week because they've been going through practices and scrimmages and things like that. Uh, this was a highly competitive game. Yes, it was an All-Star game. Yes, you did have guys throwing alley-oops and stuff. But it wasn't, you know, to me, your typical All-Star game where you have just, you know, runway, nobody guarding anybody, just let guys go and dunk it and, and everybody just launching threes. Guys really got to showcase their game. We really got to see, uh, test their metal against the best in the country. And that the one the primary matchup the premier matchup for this game was Paolo Ban- Bancaro against Chet Holmgren. Uh, depends on who you ask, but almost everyone thinks those guys are one and two, whether it be Holmgren one or or, or Bancaro one. This was the matchup everybody wanted to see. We got to see them guard each other for a majority of this game. Kendall, what did you make of those two guys locking up this uh this weekend? Yeah, I mean. You know, I, we saw what was a little, what was a little bit of a controversial move with ESPN making Van Carroll their number one, at least Draft Express, John John Zagaloni making Van Carroll the favorite to be the number one pick in the 2022 draft, um, despite Holmgren being number one by in most people's uh, in most people's eyes. Uh, so yeah, this was a matchup that a lot of people were were looking forward to by all accounts. Uh, for the people that saw the practices. Uh, it seemed like they both uh, were very impressive. Um, we know Ben Carroll ended up winning the uh, one-on-one competition that they had, uh, which for a big man is impressive. Um, you know, uh, it was not as if, you know, he was playing uh, in the post and was bullying guys. You know, it seemed like he, he relied a lot on his perimeter game. And look, that's something that we saw during the game was that Ben Carroll uh, just has an elite skill set for a guy uh, his size at his position. To be two, you know, six ten, uh, whatever he is, two thirty, um, but to have the handle, the feel for the game, play with the play with the pace that he plays with, um, on top of the fact that he has a jump shot and can finish at the rim, 
plays with a lot of strength. I mean, he's he's the total package offensively. And I think we saw that really neither one of these guys are your typical all-star game guy. Um, you know, Van Caro, uh, I think will play much better in structure. Uh, he's going to be, he's going to play much better in Duke's offense when they get him the ball, um, in spots that are, are, are more effective. Um, and I think you're going to see a guy like Chet Holmgren, who we saw play really well, uh, in this game, but also I would have loved to have seen him play on the perimeter even more because we know he has the capability, but in this game, he played more so like a big. And he still won MVP, he still played great, but it, you know, I feel like this was a different Chet Holmgren than the guy we saw uh, playing for Team Sizzle uh, last summer against uh, Imani Bates, where he was playing primarily on the perimeter. He's essentially his team's point guard, uh, and he was equally effective in that role, which was special. We've seen guys like Holmgren do what he did on the in that game where, you know, he's blocking shots, you know, he's grabbing rebounds, bringing the ball to court. Yeah, playing, more like playing, the typical, yeah, playing the typical big man role, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and he was dominant in that role, but, you know, what makes him truly a unicorn is the stuff he was doing in that Imani Bates game. So yeah. you wonder, is that the role he's going to play at Gonzaga, where he is playing more of the big man role? Because I think a lot of times you see in these all-star games, you'll see guys who were, all these guys are great, all these guys are the best or the second best player on their high school teams. But now when you watch them in this all-star setting, you get to see what guys are going to be more so on the college level. Um, so is that what Chet normally is at the college level and the NBA level? Is he a guy that primarily plays inside? Or will he be more of a perimeter player like we saw uh, last summer? And, and also defensively, you know, he, clearly he is one of the uh, best rim protectors we've seen in a long time come out of high school. Um, you know, he, he affects every shot. That gets that gets put up near the rim. Uh, the length is 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 incredible, but not just the length, but the uh, the instincts. You know that those that's something that you can't yeah, teach. Exactly. Them, the defensive instincts to be an elite level rim protector. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, you know chess role, I mean, a lot of times you know with the All Star games, this is the first time you're seeing these players play against you know comparable size compared to who they'll be playing against in college. Because a lot of these guys, when you're talking about a high school game, a regular high school game, sometimes AAU, some you know, some circuits are pretty competitive and you'll see a lot of big guys on the court. But even in AAU, you, again, it's kind of high school size guys. So, you know, the six seven guy, you know, he's the center, but he's also the point guard because he's the best player on the team, you know. So, uh, so when it comes to their roles, especially for big men, I think you see them play more like probably what you see in college because in the college game, like, there's going to be much better guard play and much better big men that you're going to have to, you know, match up against inside. So you, you'll see that happen. I think some of that is a little bit what happened with Chet. You know, he's playing with a very high end guards. All these guys are going high D one and um, he's going against, you know, really serious big men, guys who can actually hurt you in the glass and guys who can finish around the basket. So you need them in the paint. So I do think that it is an interesting kind of case study as to how they will use him at Gonzaga. And this, this will be the role because, Mark Few's teams have been smash mouth teams in terms of how their bigs are played. Maybe with the exception of Kyle Wilcher, even though he, they posted him a lot too. But you think of Karnowski, Clark, Rui, um, uh, uh, Sabonis. Uh, Sabonis, Timmy this year. I mean, they play inside out. Uh, uh, Petrosov, who's going to be drafted this year, who had a really good year overseas. They're, they're going to, they're, they're an inside out team and they play smash mouth basketball, regardless of what people think about them being a finesse team. So when they signed Chet, I was curious about how they would fit fit him within their team because most of their bigs don't have never played like Chet. Really, there are almost no bigs I've ever played like Chet, to be honest. So it was fascinating to see him play this role, and we could say maybe he wasn't as wow impressive because he wasn't dribbling the ball at the court, pulling up from 25 feet out, but he still won his team's MVP. <laughs> he still was right. a player on his team. So it suggests that he'll still be a high-impact player. But Paolo Bancaro, man, I mean... This might not have been his best shooting game or scoring game, but the tools that he has at his size, man, that guy has a chance to be really special as an offensive player. He reminds me a lot of Julius Randle. Uh, maybe not quite as strong, obviously, because Julius Randle, you know, it's just a, it's an ox. But uh, but to be that size and have that handle and that fluidity, that's kind of the game that I see for him. Um, his ball handling at his size is, is tremendous. His one-on-one game uh, is tremendous. And... And this is, is the fact that Duke is going to be playing Gonzaga early in the season, next season, 
that's going to be a great matchup to watch. And I'm excited to see what Ben Carroll does at Duke all season. I mean, to me, there was no question. We look at, you know, these kind of games, it's very easy to quickly tell who are the NBA type guys. It doesn't mean that guys won't get better. The guys maybe who played bad in this one game won't become those guys. But who are the guys right now? You say, okay, this guy, he, he's going to be in the league, you know. I mean, it was very clear. Susan Van Carroll was doing anything with the boy. Like, okay, that guy is different than everybody else in the court. Yeah. He, he's a special guy, and I can't wait to see what happens. Move on the baseline. This season. On oh, Chet, yeah. Just, yeah, it was incredible. He, he crosses him over, takes him middle, then crosses back to the baseline. Um, you know, that's, you know, not your Sports Center top 10 play. It wasn't an alley. You wasn't a crazy, wasn't a crazy move, but it might have been the most impressive play for me of the whole game. You take into consideration his size, who he did it against. Uh, and just like you said, the fluidity that he he did that move on it was just one move, but he did that. He did those kinds of he showed that kind of handle throughout the game. It wasn't sometimes you watch a game, you see a big guy do something, and you're like, yeah, but can he? Is that even repeatable? Or do right. you kind of get lucky? You know, that clearly was something that he has worked on, and he clearly would be able to do that nine times out of ten. And there were uh, some moves he made and shots that he missed where, like, I could see. Like, the fact that he could even try those moves. And, okay, he missed, but I'm like, okay, but he keeps get, yeah. working in the lab. So that's a that's a, that's a a bucket. And when when that, if, they, he, if he can do that, then he's unguardable. Like, he, he made a couple of plays throughout the game where I was like, okay, I, you know, you see why there's so much excitement for this guy. It, so for next season, for both of you guys real quick. Yeah. Uh, for Chet, how do you, what do you think would be best for his NBA draft stock and his development in terms of how they play? Like... Hmm. For his best best case scenario for him being the number one pick, like how should Gonzaga use? I mean, to me, and I kind of I mentioned Wilcher earlier. To me, he should be they should he should be the way Wilcher played next to Sabonis. And let's assume we're talking about this, assuming that Timmy is back. I think that that's the front court that that Mark Few's team should be eyeing. I think that Wilcher, I mean, excuse me, um, that Chet should essentially be a stretch four who has the ability to handle the ball. And Gonzaga's big men also handle the ball a lot, too, which is even the the guys who are your quote-unquote sledgehammers. Like, Timmy handles the ball a lot in the perimeter. They do a lot of handoffs and stuff like that. So he'll have plenty of opportunities to handle. But, like, he to me, he's he's like their power forward. He's not their five. I know he's right. maybe defensively he's the five. But to me, offensively, he should be a stretch four. And I actually think that in the NBA, that's that's his role to me, is that he's, he's, a, he's a stretch four who has the ability to be a one-on-one threat on the perimeter. Um, and, and Anthony Davis to me would probably be the guy that you look at and say, it, it, "Who is he going to play like?" That's who you want him to play like. And so, to me, it's crazy to even. I, I don't. You know I me. Mean? I hate throwing out comparisons of like all NBA NBA champion type yeah. guys. But to me, that's what Chet yeah. is projecting to be in the NBA. He's number one player in the country, and you're talking about Anthony Davis coming out, who's also the number one player in the country, but was right. also. You know, an extremely unique, you know, physical profile. There was a lot of question marks. Well, what is this guy Anthony Davis going to do? You know, when he gets to that next yeah, level, the same, they both have the same issue. Everybody's like they're too thin. Like what yeah. guy, they're way too skinny. They're not going to be able to, you know, bully guys in, in the next level. So, and then for Bancaro, the question I want to ask you is: Do you think that he should? Do you think he'll be better off hmm. if Pat Baldwin commits to Duke, or if Pat Baldwin goes somewhere? Hmm. For his personal development. Cause I almost wonder if he'd be better off on a team where he can be more heavily featured. Because as we saw in this game, yeah. like he was, a, he was a little bit lost in the sauce with all the all the talent in the in the game. When he's typically on the high school level and the AU level, he's played on programs and teams that everything is run through Paolo Bancaro. So we only have one real example of this, and it's Duke. Um but when you think of that three-headed monster of guys who kind of play similar positions, where you had, you know, Williamson, uh, Barrett, and and Reddish, you know, that's essentially what Duke would have again if if Baldwin commits to Duke. You'd have Baldwin, Griffin, who we're talking about in this game as well, and and uh, and Bancaro. I think Bancaro. I don't want people to run with this as a crazy headline. I think he's Zion-like in a sense. I'm not saying he's Zion Williamson, but I think he's Zion in the sense that, like, I don't think it matters who's on his team. He's that yeah, good. Right. He's the best player. He's going to be the man. Yeah, no he, yeah, he, yeah he's, he's getting his 20 and 10. I don't know what the mother guys are doing. Like, right. RJ and Cam had to figure it out. But when Zion came, Zion got on that court, it was very clear immediately. Okay, he, he's going to get his. 
He, wow. We're going to run everything through him. He's going to get his. He's just too dominant. I think really it's more of a question for, for Griffin if it works for him to play with Baldwin. And look. look but I, I don't think Ben Carroll can be affected at all because he's just that offensively skilled. You'd be, it'd be, you'd be an idiot to not run your offense through him. Right. Like, I don't care who <laughs> else is on your team. And it's, no, it's not a diss to Baldwin or Griffin. They're both really good players. But that guy is different. So I think Real he'll quick. be fine. What did you make of A.J. Griffin? Because he was a guy that I think got a little bit, also a little lost in this game a little bit. Um, yeah. I think he's better than he showed in this game. Like, and he's another guy that's not an all-star, mm-hmm. you know, game kind of guy. Just because he doesn't play at a super fast pace. He's low. Yeah. You can tell he plays at a more controlled pace. Um, which is going to be, I mean, him and him and Ben Carroll would be perfect for Duke in that regard. But, yeah. um, you know, I think you saw, clearly he's worked on his game. Like, his handle is more advanced. Um, you know, he's got that New York, he's got a little bit of that New York City game in t- to him with the elite athleticism and the elite physical profile. So, uh, while he didn't, he may not have had 20 points, I thought I, I came away actually pretty impressed with AJ Griffin. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I'll be honest, for me, I, I came away not as impressed by Griffin, and I'm someone who's actually very high on Griffin, so I don't want to make it sound like I, I'm just, I don't like him. I think I like him a lot. I, I came away from the game thinking that he's not really an all star game type player, so I didn't want to freak out because i expect him to be a little more dominant i do feel like for his game one you know the jump shot is going to be i think the question uh is he a consistent knockdown shooter i thought the shots that he took in this game he might have made one but a couple of those jump shots look really haywire and i i, I kind of thought that that would be the case and it was so that wasn't the greatest thing to see um handle is good and he's gotten a lot better i still think he probably has a, a, a next gear to get to for it to be nba ready um what i can say about him that did flash in this game is the athletic profile and the physical frame is elite for his for yeah. what you want him to be it's, you know a, a, a small forward nba type small forward yeah. i mean it's crazy that a high school kid is <laughs> built like him and his dad his dad is one of the better assistant coaches in the nba yeah. Probably should be a head coach at this point. From a player yeah, exactly. development standpoint, I too. I am confident that AJ Griffin is going to uh, be even better when it comes yeah. to the jump shot. Probably when we see him in Duke, you know, you're going to be like, wow, he's that much better from when he played in the Iverson Classic. So I'm I'm very bullish on his uh, on his upside. Yeah, I am too. Uh, I think that he's going to be a really good player. Um, I didn't think this was his best game, but I I thought that he actually I like I thought he had a really good second half. And I like that he kind of. I think powered through what I thought was kind of a rough first half. He wasn't really getting the ball. He really didn't know what was going on, I think. Um, I, it seemed like he got a lot more comfortable, and he started to see that that, that talent flash. Um, the other guy who was the – actually, let's stay quickly on, on his team because his, the MVP of his team was a guy that a lot of people hadn't really heard much about before this game. And not, I don't think anybody would have thought that he was going to be the MVP for his team. No. Uh, but Tyrese Hunter, who is, you know, a guy who's kind of been a, he's a four star. He's kind of been ranked in the thirties for most, um, recruiting data databases. He was the MVP for his team and it was well-deserved because he was oh, definitely yeah. the best player on his team. At least if you took game. a blind test and found somebody that had never heard of any of these guys and you asked them who's the number one player and who's the number one point guard in the country, they would have said, it's gotta be that kid, right? Yeah. I would have, yeah. I would have thought that kid was going to Duke or kansas or yeah. kentucky <laughs> like yeah uh tyrese hunter man i mean we gotta talk about him because i think that if anybody watched this game he was one of the guys that stood out oh, one of the things that were impressed well, i was impressed by was he has a super mature game <laughs> like i feel like the way he gets his shots um his just demeanor on the court his shot making because he, he showed he, yeah. he could shoot the ball and he has great distance it just to me he he didn't look like a high school player. He looked like a yeah, college he's got player. A dog, he's got a killer mentality. Yeah, tell. like, also, if you told me that these were a bunch of kids just playing, I would have thought that kid, oh, he's older than those other kids, right? Like, that's what I would have thought. And and that's not at all the case, obviously. They're all, you yeah. know, high school seniors. Um, yeah, we got to talk about Hunter, man. I thought that he had a really stellar game. You know, Iowa State's basketball yeah. program, he's committed there. They've been kind of dormant for the last few years. There's a little bit of reason to be excited, excited oh, to have this guy coming in. I mean, I, I, he looked like a real player to me. It's only one game. And I'm not sure how he was looking throughout the weekend, but to me, the if he word, looked like, the, the he looked like that, the was that. There was there was word in the practice that Tyrese Hunter was a guy to pay attention to. And yeah. I, I didn't know what to make of it because I'm like, well, we'll see. You <laughs> yeah. know, <laughs> we'll see, you know, how much this how much this sticks. And in the game, it was very clear. And that 
those are the things that are even more impressive. Because when you see, when you see a guy play great, you're like, look, maybe he was hot. Maybe in the moment, he just, you know, he was in the zone. But when you find out that he also was dominant in the practices, it shows yeah. you it's not a fluke, it's not a blip. Um, you're right, Iowa State's been a, it's been a tad bit dormant over, over the last few years. New coach in TJ, TJ Osselberger. Um, they clearly have had success with guys with the name Tyrese. Um, so that, that bodes well for his for his uh, future. But he looks like a guy that could be one and done. I don't know. Because college basketball guard plays high level. He could just be a guy that's also just a really good scorer. But, you know, it takes, it takes a few yeah. years. But I would not be shocked if he was a guy that was, you know, averaging 17 points. Actually. Yeah, I mean, and, it, it, and you know, again, he played great. I'm not here to say anything bad about his game. But the only thing I – if there's anything I would say – that if I say, okay, what keeps him from being one and done? He, you know, he's 6'1", you know, so he, right. he doesn't have great size at point guard. Now nah, he's 18. He could grow two inches or three inches. You know, you don't, you know, he still has, there's, there's potential for some growth there. But, you no, know, so he's 6'1". Um, and he looks more like a scorer than a, like, I'm going to get guys involved. But it also was an all-star game. So I don't, like, it, sometimes <laughs> it's hard to really yeah. say what that, because everybody's trying to score. But... Maybe I'm saying he's a scorer because the guy could shoot and he, he was getting buckets. But to me, like I didn't necessarily see a guy who was like, I'm going to just get guys open. Even like on like, the fast breaks where he's just trying to get – like he wasn't doing that. He was trying to score. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, so I, you know, you, sometimes you wonder, okay, is he like a small shooting guard um, who just has a great handle so therefore he's playing point? Yeah, Maybe his that, Yeah, his handle is yeah. incredible. Shot creation, step backs. Yeah, just a complete offensive game. Like you said, very mature, very mature offensive game for a high school point guard. And I gotta say that just about. I gotta say that really about all these kids. One thing would be, I mean, these kids not texted during the game. I mean, they these kids shoot so well now. I mean, the Steph Curry yeah. effect, the Dame Lillard effect uh, on the high school game and the youth basketball is real. Because I feel like when I watch youth basketball or especially high school basketball all American games. It seemed like maybe there were two or three guys. You said, okay, that guy has a legit NBA shot. And everybody else, it was like, man, they all got work on their jump shots. And I don't, I didn't feel that way watching that game. I'm like, these guys can shoot the ball. Even the guys that, you know, with all the hops. Usually the guys with all the hops, they weren't the guys that could shoot. But then you see, them pull, you see a couple of these guys pulling from 30. And I'm like, yeah. oh, he could do that too. The game starts out, and a big man, Brandon Hat, Hat, uh, Huntley Hatfield, yeah. uh, it's a three. You know, just yeah, know. Like this wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. I know, it's yeah. It's back-to-back threes, I believe. Yeah, so, he had, yeah, he had back-to-back jump shots. Exactly. Yeah, he had back-to-back three. So that, there's no way that happened a decade ago. It's a, it's a completely different game. And look, the best shooter in the country, Dane Hardy, what, didn't even play. You I know. know. I mean, you, you want to talk about a real shooter. We'll, we'll probably talk about him at some point in the YouTube channel. But that, that, that's an elite, elite shooter. But, but yeah, the, the shooting uh, was, was certainly high level. Um, were there any other guards in this game that, that, that kind of caught your attention? So, so, so yeah, so we're talking about the guards. And so I'll be honest, I thought the guards shot well, but I thought the guards had a little bit of trouble in this game. Um, they, they didn't, I mean, to me, again, I thought Hunter really stood out. And I think he partly also stood out because I thought he was way above a lot of the other guards. Um, Davison's an unbelievable athlete. I love how he competes. Um, I think there's, there's sophistication still needed in his offensive game in order to make yeah. him a, a functioning scorer. Um, but he's a very willing and very slick passer, which I like to see. Uh, and like I said, the athleticism is just, I mean, I, he, he's one of those guys. He's like John Wall, Derrick Rose, Russell Westbrook. Athlete. Yeah, he's the top 1%. Yeah, the like the top like 0.01% point of yeah. point guard athlete. Like yeah. what he can do. And we didn't. Yeah. I don't even think we don't got to see him get up and down as much as you know as we've seen in, in other tapes. But even the time he did, he flashed yeah. athleticism. It was just. It was yeah, strange. yeah. There were plenty of times. Obviously, he won the dunk contest in this event, but there were plenty of there there there, there were plenty of moments where he probably, you know, in a, in a in a different situation would have been able to you know boom it on a guy's head. But yeah, um, it, I was impressed by his passing. You know, it, yeah, he still has to develop the jump shot. Handle has to get a little bit better. But the passing is what's going to make him a point guard. Because at the end of the day, you can be like you mentioned with Tyrese Hunter, like you could be a you could be a guy with a great handle and not be a point guard. You know, but yeah. it's hard to be a great point guard without being a very good passer, and he has that uh, already. And that's something that's hard to learn. And I think uh, he's going to a good team too. I mean, they got guards. Javon Quinterly. 
Yeah. Uh, Shaq is going to talk about improving your skill level. Yeah. Javon Quinley is going to be one of the most skilled point guards in college basketball next year. So yeah. playing with that guy is going to get your, your point guard game, you know, tight when it comes yeah. to your handle. And, and Shaq Prefer is going to be also be on that team, and he'll he'll be, uh, you know, doing a lot of ball handling and stuff too. So I feel like he'll find a great role on that Alabama team. Who I he think might be a two-year good. guy because of that. He That's might be. You know, yeah. will he? And nowadays, two-year guy means, you know, a year and then into the portal, unfortunately. But, you know, but he's probably a two-year guy because of that. Where he's gonna, you know, year two, he'll be the guy in the backcourt for for yeah. for Alabama. But I think when you're talking about next season, um, he'll be the two, and that'll be fine, you know, because he he's gonna be electric and he's gonna really, but he's not gonna have the Sharif Cooper kind of year. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't know I, if there is anybody in this class that's gonna have that kind of season. Um, you know, we didn't see Kennedy Chandler play, obviously committed to Tennessee. But, right, he he would uh, probably be the guy. Yeah, that's what you would think. I mean, Nolan Hickman played pretty well. I thought uh, Hickman played pretty good. Yeah, I thought his first half better than the second half. But uh, yeah. Hickman, to me, um, he looked like – I mean, to me, he looked like the purest point guard to me. Um, right. In terms of he can get his baskets. He can also run the team. He he looks like – he looked great, I thought. Um, he had what do you a make- really good game. Sorry, what were you going to say? He, uh, former Kentucky commit. But what do you <laughs> make of Ty Ty Washington, who – uh, you know, by the time you watch this video, probably will already have been con- committed to no. Kentucky. Uh, yeah. Because that's where we think he's going. What did you make of his game? Yeah, so I wanted to get to side side watch because when we say who, what guard did well besides Hunter, I thought he was the second best guard to me. Um, I mean, he's a great shooter. I mean, he, he is yeah. a, a... I mean, he reminds me of a guy that also played at Kentucky and plays for the Knicks in, uh, in Emmanuel quickly in a lot of ways. Interesting. Um, I have another Kentucky comp, but I'll that's, that's what. Because um, to me, I mean, he he may come in and there may be more to his game, but right now, to me, the what brings it, he's a good passer, but like to me, his shooting is what really yeah. impresses you. I mean, he he gets any kind of space, whether it's in catch up, catch and shoot, or pull up. He's money. He was money in that game. He won the three point contest during the weekend. Uh, he's a he's a lights out kind of shooter, so that's going to get him immediate minutes on the floor at UK and he'll he'll be an impact player because of it. I thought he had a stellar game and he was the other guard I would say that thought had the second best game. I would say it was Hunter, then it was uh, uh Washington and then I would go with um Hickman. Hickman I thought played better in the first half, Washington played better in the second half and whatever that overtime thing was. Uh but Washington Washington's shooting was just so ridiculous that one. Kentucky that I give him the edge. Obviously, right now, Kentucky has Kellen Grady coming in yeah. from Davidson, high-level shooter. Um, now you're bringing in Ty Ty Washington. I mean, they had Ty Hero a few years ago, excellent shooter. But even Hero was a little – he was a little streaky at Kentucky. Um, they had Emmanuel quickly as well. Um, they had – you know, but I feel like Ty Ty is going to be the best shooter since month to, to play yeah. at Kentucky. Um and that that is going to be, or at least like a one and done guy. At least the, you know, assuming he's going to be a freshman, the best freshman shooter uh, since since Malik Monk. Um, but I feel like to me the comp when you're talking about Kentucky guards, I think about Brandon Knight, and that's that's you know that's I like that one too. high praise. Yeah, yeah, that's high praise for a guy. I mean, look, some may well, first of all, let's bring, let's bring it back. Young people are going to hear that and think, wait, the guy that. You know, got crossed by Kyrie. Yeah, who dunked on, on by DeAndre Jordan. By yeah, DeAndre he's, Jordan. Yeah, he's like the uh, Eugene <laughs> from Hey Arnold. Of, yeah, he's like the Eugene of hate from Hey Arnold of the NBA. <laughs> but he's yeah, a exactly. very accomplished NBA player and was a great high yeah. school player. Yeah, I mean, he was the number one player in the in the country coming out of yeah, high school. Exactly. And I believe that was the same year that Kyrie came out, and yeah. it wasn't a fluke. <laughs> he was actually a college player too. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, so Brandon being comp to Brandon Knight means that Ty Ty is going to be a stud next season. Great shooter, size about six four, can can finish at the rim. Um, it, it'll be it'll the question will be how does he create his shot? Um, you know, right. and that that'll be the that'll be the question next season. But you know, I mean, he's going to be playing on a very good team, so they're going to just be able. They're going to need guys that can make open shots. They haven't had they haven't had that in a, in a while, and like you said, guys like Quickly and Brandon Knight were that. So 
I think Ty Ty is going to be uh, excellent, assuming he's at Kentucky. Yeah, if UK fans, uh, I think that you know they've seen them struggle from out from the, from the perimeter this season. Um, they had quickly the year before, but really no other shooters besides him. That's been a, a Achilles heel for that team. So that's definitely something that they're uh, looking looking for uh, over there in Lexington. In terms of the other, uh, the, the let's talk, let's talk about the swing men that were in this game as well. Um, I felt like to me. It, it, this was kind of a it was kind of a weird mismatch of guys. You know, we already talked about AJ Griffin a great deal. Um, what did you make of Hunter Salas, uh, another guy who's going to Gonzaga? To me, when I when I, I texted you, to me, uh, I, I said that you know he this this guy is an unbelievable athlete. I mean, yeah. Um, to me, <laughs> Salas maybe because he kind of looks like him, but to me, he looks like a he he's like a poor man Jalen Green to me, where it's like. The athleticism, the size, right. the like same kind of size, same like their functionality is the same. Green way more advanced offensively, but I think yeah. the 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 blueprint for what kind of player Salas can become or what he should look for, I think that is there with, with Jalen Green to me, who to be in being a similar player. I liked what I saw from him. Um, I, I think he's going to be able to shoot the ball, uh, but just the way he can get out on the break and and and, and just. His leaping ability is, is just special. He's a player unlike any Gonzaga I think has had. Um, when you talk about the, the twitch and the athleticism, yeah. you know, I texted you, I mean, might be the twitchiest player in Gonzaga history when he steps foot on campus. Uh, outside of maybe Dimitri Goodson, who, like I said, you know, dude had NFL corner twitch, obviously ended up playing for the Green Bay Packers. So that's a different type of, that's a different type of athleticism. But uh, Hunter Salas, uh, I mean, just a, uh, we're going to talk about it again, another top 1% athlete. He's in that class. Um, he's going to definitely need to be able to get stronger. Uh, but I actually think him playing in the West Coast Conference, like, he's not going to really feel it, you know? Let's just be honest. You it's know, no disrespect. Point. But, yeah. you know, I don't know if, you know, Pepperdine is really, really strong <laughs> on the wing necessarily. Really I think they it. actually, I think they, of all the teams you could have named, I think they actually yeah, are strong like, on the wing. <laughs> yeah, hey, Cody Ross is, is a baller. But, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> So yeah, maybe 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 I yeah. picked the wrong. Yeah, you probably know. should call like the Portland. You should probably call them the Portland Pirate Pilots or or San yeah, Diego exactly. or something like that. You know, San Fran. But no, I mean, you know, him going to the West Coast Conference, he's going to be excellent. Um, I think he seems like the kind of guy where he's he'll probably play better in conference play than non conference. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see him actually having to to adjust to the college game a little bit. But when that happens, um, he's going to be dynamic. You know he's gonna be because he, the athleticism is too is too high level, um, and that's something that they lacked. I think we saw you know against Baylor was yeah. you know Baylor was a team that just had uh, too much twitch, too much yeah. speed, too much athleticism, and Gonzaga didn't have enough of that on the perimeter, um, and so adding adding a guy a hundred dollars changed the profile of that team a little, a little bit. Yeah, watching um, watching that another game wing, me, watching that game to me it was just like I was like this is the guy Gonzaga needed against Baylor. Like this, this is the kind yeah. of guy to be able to cover Butler and cover Mitchell. Yeah. I don't know how well he now, would have done, but he's the only guy that would have had a shot if he was on the roster. Even yeah. though he's already, even though he's seventeen now, like they, he, like yeah. that's that's the kind of athlete they needed. Now he's not Jalen Suggs, you know, and you know, I know they were, yeah. you know, when he committed, there were people like, look, I mean, technically he's the biggest recruit in Gonzaga history At, over Jalen Suggs. I'm like, look, he's not, I, he's not Jalen Suggs, and I think we saw that in this game. That's no. That's no. Actually, not and I've also seen some people. Out. I see some people saying they think he's a point guard. I, I don't. I don't see that. Um, yeah. I, I yeah, see. I, don't a, see, I see a guy on the wing, but I. I, I but because of his athleticism, I can see people feeling like if we could turn this guy to. He's gonna have the ball in his hands a ton. Yeah. Playing. And again, he's gonna break down some some West Coast Conference guards. Uh, you know, a ton in the West Coast in, in that conference. But another wing that I I was super impressed by. Was uh was Matthew Cleveland? Yeah, uh, you know, going to Florida State, uh, seemed just like a jack of all trades. You know, a guy that not a special athlete per se, not a special shooter, but really mature, advanced game. Uh, and I thought it was one of the five or six best players on the floor, and that was impressive. He played hard. Um, he will say a guy that's going to be able to get minutes right away in Tallahassee. Yeah, I was going to mention Matt Cleveland as well. Uh, you know, it's rare you see, you know, a hustle guy at the All-Star game. But this is that's what he was. I mean, the guy was yeah. ev- he was everywhere. And 
And I like that. Like, I, I like seeing a guy take it that seriously and not play the, especially in high school also game, not play the Joe Cool or just be like, um, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to get off when I get my one-on-one isolation opportunities. I don't know if he had any during the whole game. Yeah. He still ended up with double-digit points. I mean, he, was, he still must have 15, 16 points, whatever he had. Yeah. Like, like he was just running the floor. He was guarding the hell out of anybody who was in front of him. And he was rebounding, like, and I watched this guy play, and you could have told me I wouldn't. If you told me to guess what school did that guy play for, I probably would have guessed Florida State. Like, yeah, I was gonna say, like you he know, looks I know like you said a Florida that, State guy. I know you said that you know you loved him playing with that kind of hustle and intensity. You know who else loved it? My guy Lenny Hamilton. <laughs> oh you know, yeah, I absolutely <laughs> loved seeing Matt Cleveland play, and I I guarantee you that that's that's part of the reason why he's going to Tallahassee and why they loved him so much. You know, bringing in a guy like him. You know, he plays, again, almost similar to Scotty Barnes in that regard with that, you know, grit and that intensity. Um, they're going to have, they have, the, they have a hell of a recruiting class coming they in next do. year. And he's going he's gonna to be a part of that. Um, uh, you know, another, another forward that I, you know, I'm going to talk about because, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a huge Memphis Tigers fan. Got to mention my guy, Josh Minot. Uh, I thought he was excellent. You know, he, he started too. off the game, you know, a little slow. Uh, you know, he, 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 you can tell he's raw. You can tell, um, he's, he's got the, the, the first, I mean, we see him, he looks like an NBA player with his size, uh, his length. Um, and he's got a little bit of athleticism to go along with it. Uh, and the word throughout the practice was that Minot was playing really well. Um, but in the game, I think you saw, especially in the second half, the, the kind of player that he can be. Um, really, uh, uh, just a toolsy kind of guy. Where again, the length, the athleticism, and then also the skill level, uh, particularly his ball handling ability. Um, like I think he's gonna be a really good player. It may take a little bit of time. Like he may not be a, you know, right out of the gate gonna come in and dominate guy. But similar to Salas, by the time we get into conference play, uh, again in the American Conference, like he's not playing in the ACC. No, no disrespect to the American or the West Coast Conference, but. Uh, you know, when he, when he's posting up dudes on Tulane, you know, it's got him on the, in a face-up situation. I just can't imagine they're going to be able to guard a guy like Josh Minot. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be terrific. He, he could end up being one and done. I don't think he will be, but I don't think it's out of the question. Yeah, it's funny. Like, he got a lot of buzz among kind of the NBA people that were watching this yeah. week and in, in this game. I'll tell you what, if Hunter was the guy that you said, who was not on the NBA uh, college radar – that now is, it would be Hunter. You told me, what guy wasn't on your NBA radar, but now is, is Joshua Minot. Um, yeah. Like, to me, and it's not to say Hunter can't be a great NBA player, but, you know, Hunter, again, 6'1", you know, guards are a lot more of them, so it's a lot more competition in that regard. Minot, again, you're looking more in terms of NBA, you're looking at your projecting physical frame, ability to fill out uh, how his game will develop, given his size, I mean, Minot has a nice framework to work with. Uh, shout out to Cody Topper there in Memphis. Um, I mean, oh yeah, you know Cody's gonna have him in the lab. Oh yeah, and that I, is gonna be tight. Oh yeah, because this guy has a lot of tools. I mean, again, he has a natural handle. He's got to work a lot on it, but it's there. Um, the athleticism is crazy. He's probably he was sweet to probably the second best athlete, or maybe the best. It was either him or or, or uh, Salas. I mean, those two yeah, guys were the best athletes. Yes, and Davidson, of course. Um, so, yeah, maybe you know, Davidson's one, and those guys are next for two. Right. Um, but, I mean, guys, it was the best, definitely the best athlete among those six, seven, six, eight guys for sure. Uh, he can shoot. I mean, yeah. it's it, he's a very interesting prospect. I felt like, to me, when I when I saw the rosters come out, and, and I've, I've gotten to watch almost all these guys. I didn't see Hunter before. Um, when I saw mine not on there, I was like, okay. Let's see how he does. I to me, and we talked about him on this on uh, the Uncommitted podcast. Wait, I, I, yeah, I, I've said that I felt he was a little raw, a lot of potential, but we'll see kind of how it goes. So I saw, it, I was like, okay, he's on, he's going against some dogs. Let's see yeah. how he holds up against these guys. And he held up way better than most of the guys on the court. I mean, yeah, he was. Yeah, he, if yeah. there was 20, 22 guys on these team on both teams, I mean, he was in the top ten that easily. Like you know, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I thought he was someone that that absolutely stood out. He he had I I'm I was very impressed with with him, and I think that what I, he's going to be a guy. I don't I think maybe he needs to do more than one year, but yeah. I, if you tell me in two three years that he's a top ten pick, 
would not be surprised at all from what I saw. What I what I love about him going to Memphis is not only we mentioned Cody Topper's player development background, but um, you know, obviously Penny, you know, being a guy, you know, at his size with that kind of skill level that he yeah. had. Um, and when you have guys on the roster, they're going to bring back a more veteran roster of guys that have a similar body type or a similar play a similar position at that forward spot. You know, with Landers Nolly and you know, bring to bring back Lester Quinones and DeAndre Williams is a dog. Like those guys, you know, are going to be more veteran guys, juniors and seniors that can you know that that's going to rub off on on Josh Minot. You know, and they're going to play with a defensive intensity. That all that stuff is going to help. Them. So, you know, like you said, I mean, he may not be one and done, but um, in a couple of years, he will say he's going to be a player. Absolutely. And then I think one of the last guys we got to mention as well is uh, Foster, um, who was the... Mike Foster. Yeah, he was a co-MVP uh, for uh, team, uh, team Honor in that game. And he's not going to be playing college basketball. So, unfortunately, we won't be able to kind of, you know, stack him up against other college kids. But he will be, you know, playing playing with the G League. And I got to say, I liked what I saw. Like I told you, to me, if, if, if Bancaro reminds me of Julius Randle today with the New York Knicks, uh, Foster reminds me of Julius Randle, like, at Kentucky or with the, with right. the Lakers. And that may not sound like a knock, but it really isn't to me. It, <laughs> yeah, it's like Brandon uh, Knight. It's like, I mean, you're talking about a dominant player. Right, exactly. I mean, to, and to me, like, of course – you know, Foster can grow into the Julius Randle in the Knicks. I don't think he's there now. But, I mean, the guy is a sledgehammer. You, you know, it, I'm trying to think of the last time I, I saw, like, a, a power forward with, like, his, like, game. And I can't really, like, just, like, the ability to just be, like, at, at 18 years old or whatever he old he is, to be, like, I can just go in and just go to my left hand and just power through anybody who's in the paint. It doesn't matter who it is. And I can get my shot, or I'll be just a, a horse on the glass. He, he, I mean, he, he's in the mold of guys like Isaiah Stewart, guys like yeah. these Conigan, you know, who were just dominant high school bigs, dominant college bigs, more athletic than both of those guys, yeah. a little longer than both of those guys, maybe similar in length to Isaiah Stewart, but you know, you know, guy has probably a little more pop than those guys, which is why Randall Cop is a little bit more, you know, intriguing because Randall had a little bit more pop than those guys. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, I mean, Mike Foster, you could see why the G League and why pro teams were interested in a guy like him because he clearly has a physical profile that is not normal for, for high school big men. Um, he is he's an elite athlete, elite strength. Um, he's going to be a great rebounder. The question is just going to be, so, you know, will he be able to fine-tune some of the some of the parts of his game that, uh, you know, are lacking, whether it be, you know, a feel for the game, you know, and yeah. some of the nuanced uh, basketball instinct stuff that he's got to work on. But I, you know what, I think about, you know, I mentioned in our uh, in our video talking about Mike Foster and the uncommitted, you know, I mentioned how him going to the G League, he's a little bit more like Isaiah Todd. Um, I think we saw playing for the G League Ignite, Isaiah Todd really upped his profile because he played with a much higher basketball IQ, and he played with a, a much, he slowed his game down in ways that scouts were shocked. You know, I think a lot of people yeah. were down on Isaiah Todd because, you know, his shot selection was poor. He thought he was more of a wing when he was a big. Yeah. And Brian Shaw coached a lot of that out of him. Yeah, so I coaching. think, you know, we're going to see, we, you know, Foster is going to be a similar project for Brian Shaw in that he's going to have to get some of those things out of Mike Foster's game. But if he does, we could be looking at a guy's lottery pick next year. And if there were, you know, two guys who I thought maybe I, I you know, could based on their billing as high school players, I thought maybe didn't live up to that in this game. Um, I thought uh, Damian Collins going to Kentucky. Uh, no, I, to me, the you know, bigs have a tough time in this game. So I thought him and uh, and um, Peyton Watson uh, going to UCLA. I thought both guys had a kind of a tough time figuring I, out I what like to do out there. You did. I agree. Right. I, I agree that Collins. You know, a, it was a tough game for him to go out and show up. Um, yeah. You know, I know Gavoni had said earlier in the week, or like last week, I believe, before this event, that thought that Collins and Chet was like a toss up. Uh, I, I can't. I don't I can't know what he's far. looking at. I don't. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what he's talking. Yeah, about. Yeah, I, I can't go that far. Right now. Maybe and maybe it, the, it, the gap closes. Collins and Collins is a really good player and intriguing really, prospect. 
Yes, he is. But you know, come on, you now. talk about the athleticism, the length. It, it's intriguing, but he's got to get stronger. Yeah, and his skill level right now is uh, it's not at the level. He run, I mean, me, he reminds me of Greg Brown at Texas. Right. You know. Yeah, like, actually, like a little bit. Not, not, not to get, He's not going to have any of the perimeter skills that Greg Brown no. has. No, but some of the. But I mean, that's kind of. But that's kind of worse. Like. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. You know I mean, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like Greg Brown's perimeter yeah. game ain't all that. Like. Right. Like, to me, in anything, I think that Greg Brown should probably play a little more like Collins, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Greg Brown, yeah. Some of that is, is yeah, it's his own, you know, it's some of the problems with Greg Brown's game. But, um, yeah, I thought watching clearly flashed a lot of athleticism. Yeah. Um, you know, and, yeah, look, I know it's not a dunk contest. You know, <laughs> we're yeah. glad to see guys do a little more than that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he's going to be a guy. I don't know if he's going to come in and average 20. You know, but he's certainly going to help uh, UCLA offensively. I don't. He's not going to be a one-for-one replacement with Juzang if Juzang stays in the draft. But um, they're going to have to pick up some of that slack. But I think he's going to be a guy that's going to impress people uh, and impress scouts, similar to how Keon Johnson did at Tennessee. You know, mm-hmm. just just the athleticism, and um, you know, he's going to have to earn some stuff defensively. One more guy I want to mention because we yeah. forgot to mention when we talked about Duke was Trevor Keels. Uh, who's committed to Duke, who, um, you know, they mentioned on the broadcast, was the youngest player playing in the event. Uh, but you could tell his skill level is is really high. You know, yes. he's, he's strong, two-guard, shoot the basketball. Um, you know, again, when we talked about the high level of shooting in this event, um, he, he, you know, might have been up there. Him and Ty Ty were clearly the two best shooters out there. Um, you know, he might be a guy that, you know, again, even if they don't get Pat Baldwin, like he he could wind up really helping that that Duke team. Um, you know, they're bringing back Jeremy Roach. You already have uh, you know Keels now committed. You've got Griffin. You got Banchero. Uh, I mean, that Duke team. Mark Williams is coming back. We'll see what happens with Pat Baldwin. I honestly don't think it matters. I mean, it matters yeah. in the national championship picture, but it won't <laughs> yeah. matter whether or not the team's going to be dominant or not next year. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of there's a reason for people maybe to kind of quelch any of the talk of Coach K's demise because this seemed like a, a very much – this reminded me of that one year where, like, he, he retired in the middle of the year. and he, Or not retired, but, he you know, he was out because he was sick. Oh, or was that, like, 96 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, 96. They were terrible. They won, like, 12 games. He was like, I can't coach. I'm hurt or whatever. And then some other guy came in and coached the rest of the season. That was – yeah. I think Terry P. Parks was their best player. And they came yeah. back next year and they were great. Like that to me, this to me is what's happening. Is this this year, this the year which is a bad year, bad mix. You know, he didn't seem like he wanted to be there. He was basically begging them to cancel the season. Uh <laughs> and, and then and then but like sure surely the next season or the next few seasons, Duke became Duke again. Uh yeah. I think that Duke's gonna be a, a stellar team again this year and Trevor Keels uh, is gonna be a part of that that just loaded roster. And, uh, man, I love that we had this Iverson Classic. You know, again, it's unfortunate this pandemic has taken so much from us and a big thing in regards to covering high school basketball and college basketball and recruiting is these all-star games. So the fact that we got one that was televised, you know, it was streamed, really, not televised, but one that was streamed that we could watch. You know, shout-out to Allen Iverson, of course, you know, the answer yeah. for having Alex this Jack, whole thing. Jack, Jack, yeah, she, she Bonzi Wells, well. Matt, Matt Barnes. Matt Barnes. Was it? I didn't see Matt Barnes there, but... Yeah, know. he was supposed to be assistant guard. I'm sure he helped put it together in the back. Yeah, maybe he didn't make it there. I don't know. But he was supposed to be there. <laughs> uh, and, of course, shout out, you know, Showtime Basketball. All, all the also, people. shout out to Raven Johnson, who was out there going to South Carolina. For sure. She was the only girl playing in the event. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a hell of a, that's a, hell of a challenge and a hell of an accomplishment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, go out there not, and to somewhat hold your own, you know? Yeah. Like, I, you know, there were times definitely they were trying to attack her on, on offense, you know, which I, I wasn't a huge fan of. But, hey, look, it's competition. Again, NBA scouts are there. But, but shout out to her for not, for not backing down. Yeah, shout out for her showing up. I really hope that Excellent in the experience. future. Yeah, I hope in the future the Iverson Classic has a women's game. I don't know if maybe they couldn't because of the, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, we we're in a pandemic and maybe they felt like it would be too many people or whatever. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, she should have been had the opportunity to showcase her talents against no comparable competition, but the fact that she went out there against these guys and gave it her all and played hard and made some plays, you know, yeah. you can't help but you know tip your cap to someone like that. So yeah, shout out to her; she did a, a unbelievable job. 
But I think that's going to do it for this video, man. Hope you guys enjoyed this wrap-up of the Iverson Classic. Um, of course, if you like this kind of content, we do the Uncommitted Podcast, which is a high school basketball recruiting podcast dedicated to high school basketball and recruiting and college basketball news as a whole. So make sure, again, you can catch that on this channel, New Generation Media. You can also catch that podcast on the New Generation Podcast Network. That's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and TuneIn. So make sure you catch us on those spots. Uh, you can find us on social media. We're on Twitter and on Facebook. So thank you guys so much for checking us out. For Kendall, I'm EJ. Take it easy, guys. Peace.